Good afternoon. My name is Terry Bankert. This is uh, FlintTalkRadio.com, uh, the best uh, uh, venue on the internet, uh, a source of independent news for you. And I'm going to tell you, in this era where newspapers are going out of business, more of you should get involved in providing good information to the community. Now, what I want to talk to you about today is something that I just hold very dear, dear and that's governmental accountability and why. Uh, I used to be City of Flint Ombudsman, and in that capacity, I investigated government specifically, and well, to include the police department and within the police department, allegations of police brutality. I did that for seven years of my life. And in that, I came away with a feeling that we need to challenge police procedures. And usually, it's only at the time of a crisis. I mean, think for a moment, how many times we've thought that when we read in the newspaper that some child got killed at an intersection and the resolution was to put a light in. Well, why didn't we think about whether or not that intersection needed a light and why didn't we correct it before a child got hurt? Well, here we have a situation where we have a child who has been killed by the Bay City Police Department. A child, anybody under 18 is a child under the law. Um, there's a lot of discussion about this young man. Uh, his own family said that he was acting up and he was unruly. So that's going to be a given. And he was confronted by three policemen. He was a slightly built man. And now he's dead. And how did he die? He died when a unit of the Bay City Police Force, a representative, killed him by the use of a deadly force instrument called a taser. Now, we're all led to believe that tasers are okay. How do we know they're okay? Well, we see the pictures of uh, these really physically fit young policemen being self-tasered to, or being tasered by their buddies and surviving it to show that how harsh it is, but you can survive it. We don't see these demonstrations done in young children or women or, or intoxicated individuals, but tasers cause death. There's now a, a debate going on internationally about the extended deployment of tasers. There's an intense argument going on in the United Kingdom. In Canada, there's currently a trial going on where some Mounties tasered to death uh, a, an immigrant in an airport. And by the way, they lied about it. And they're now recanting their stories because a gentleman came forward with a video. But Amnesty International has an intensive international debate going on about the use of tasers. Now, in contrast, Taser is a multi-million dollar operation. It is the sole provider of the Taser gun. And they have a PR department that's going to come in and defend their instrument. We saw comments on this in the press as being Taser is going to come in to help the police department. They're coming in to defend their product. They're coming in to defend their product from governmental scrutiny. They're coming in to defend their product from state legislation that restricts tasers. The facts of this situation are uh, a 16-year-old, a 15-year-old gentleman was drunk. He was in a house. He was acting up. The owners of the house called the police, and they were all family members. The house was crowded. The police arrived. The kid was still drunk. And he acted up. And at some juncture, he was tasered at least once. It was, I believe the police chief said it was a five-second jolt. And then he was handcuffed. And then the officers requested medical attention. But he died. In my book, that makes taser a lethal weapon like a gun. So it's bunk BS when they're saying this is a safe alternative. No, it's not. Children are dying. Amnesty International put out figures that 300 and 
50 people have died since 2005 use of the taser. I think that number may be correct. If it's one, it's too many. It's my understanding that the police chief, when he uh, talked to the press today, said that the officers complied with the law. They only applied the force necessary given the situation. Those weren't the exact words, but I recognize those words from my experience in conducting police brutality complaints. That is the more generalized statement on the use of force. But if you look at the literature and if you review the literature, there is a need for specific policy on the use of tasers. And I'm going to presume that the city of Bay City, Michigan, doesn't have a policy on taser because they didn't talk about it today. They just talked about this general criteria. Well, that's the argument you use to defend yourself from a civil suit. That's not the argument you use to debate public policy. So now we have possibly the city of Bay City that does not have a taser policy. The next thing we should ask is what training did these officers have and that, what training does the department have and what training does these officers have? And specifically, what is the career history of the officer that pulled the trigger? See, here's my whole point. There's a thousand questions we should be asking. And this isn't a matter of, oh, you're not supporting your police department. If you ask questions, bunk, okay? I'm not naming individual officers' names. I'm talking public policy. So within this argument of public policy, then, there's a couple different ways that tasers work. It's a projectile that comes out of an end of the gun, sticks in you, and, electri- and, and then a volt of electricity passes through. Okay? The police chief said that only one volt was applied. Well, a twitchy, how do we know that? How do we test for that? How can that be proved? Is there a record in that taser gun that says how many times it was deployed? I hope the state police tells us that. Also, a taser can be touched to the body and act like a stun gun. Did these things happen? I'm going to presume they didn't because the police chief said they didn't. But that's why we need an investigation. And and I'm going to tell you, here's how this investigation is going to wash if the elected leadership does not get involved. Okay. The police chief has sent it to the state police to investigate. Okay, perfect. They investigate for criminality. And they will review the actions of the officer to say, was this criminal? Did the officer commit a crime? That's what the state police does. Then the prosecutor will look at the state police report and evaluate it for criminality. Did the police officers involved commit a crime? Well, the answer is going to be no and no. I mean, these guys were called to a domestic scene and stuff happened. They didn't go there intending to kill anybody. So we can presuppose what the findings of the state police are going to be and the prosecutor. Now we get to the department. The department will review the situation for compliance with its own rules and procedures. And if it doesn't have a procedure on the use of a stun gun, and I'll explain later why that's important, what is he going to do? He's going to say that the officer applied the force necessary. The kid was acting up, and rather than getting beaten up by the police, he got a stun. The department will say he acted adequately. But what was the training on the use of a stun gun? The literature is also going to show that these stun gun deaths are sometimes sudden deaths. They occur because somebody stops breathing after they're restrained. So there are cases, you just Google this. I mean, I'm not dreaming this up and I haven't done this all my life. Uh, I found this out in the last 48 hours. Google it. Uh, There's cases and reports that say that when somebody is stunned, and they are of of a highly agitated nature, meaning that they're all worked up and excited. When they get stunned, they have a higher probability of dying. I wonder if the officers knew that, okay? That's departmental policy and procedures, and that's what we should be arguing and looking at, and that's what every city, every jurisdiction, every police department in the state of Michigan should be looking at. What are your procedures on stun guns if you use them 
Are the procedures adequate? How often are they updated? And what is the training of your officers? And I think every elected official should be asking that, the state legislature should be asking that, and the governor should demand it of the state police. So that's what can happen. Those are the questions that are, and you notice I'm not condemning the individual officers at all. And I think that everybody that's trying to condemn the victim ought to just be quiet. This isn't about castigating the victim or their family. This is about governmental policy. So now we have a whole range of issues to look at in terms of what happened on that night. What is the public policy that allows the Bay City Police Department to use a stun gun that killed a child? Would any policy defend it? I don't think so, but you have to have policy and stun guns are being used. So now we have a weapon that has been demonstrated will kill somebody uh, without the knowledge of the officers that it would kill them. But here's what happens. Somebody gets a stun. A lot of these cases are multiple jolts. And think about how easy it is once those wires are in the victim's body uh, to just pull the trigger a couple times. And if you're not trained, I've never handled a stun gun. I don't know if you can do even do it inadvertently. But... The child goes into some form of convulsion. He vomits. He falls face first. The literature shows ample cases where people then become calm and die because they quit breathing. Now, training, I think, would come into bear. Uh, officers should be trained to know what to do if a uh, victim falls into death from a stun. You should be able to predict that maybe airways should be, I'm, I'm not going to guess. There's a number of procedures that are probably identifiable that could have been done. Were they? How are the officers trained? So here we are now, a child died. The victim's families say that the police wouldn't let them do anything. Uh, well, I'm going to tell you, I've seen this on TV. Uh, I've seen this in my own cases, that once a perpetrator is under the control of the police, um, they leave him in handcuffs. They're not medical personnel. They wait for the paramedics to come. And so maybe you had a couple minute window there where the family was looking on while the child was obviously suffocating to death and then died. And the police didn't do anything because of what? Policy? What is the policy? of the Bay City Police Department when a young man has handcuffs on, is under their control, collapses in his own vomit, and is struggling to, to breathe. What is their policy? Just to call an ambulance? See, these are the range of questions that the community should be answering. Not condemning the victim or the victim's families, and at this juncture, not even condemning the individual officers. I think this is a policy-driven problem or a lack of policy driven problem. So here we are. We have a lethal weapon called a stun gun that probably doesn't have promulgated rules and procedures within the Bay City Police Department. So now they're going to just say, well, we only applied the force we thought necessary. Well, bunk. We know people are dying from this. We know they're dying not as a planned event by the police department, but they're dying. You are putting 50,000 volts of electricity into another human being's body with an instrument that we are presuming you know how to use. So the literature coming out of Great Britain and I think Canada is saying, do not deploy these stun guns to security guards. Do not deploy these stun guns to police officers that are under trained and really reconsider even your use of the stun gun. What is it used for? Because somebody's acting up. I saw a YouTube video where somebody got stunned because they wouldn't sign for the traffic ticket. I mean, we have to be careful. This is a gun. This kills people. So my name's Terry Bankert. This is FlintDogTalk.com. Uh, that's my two cents worth on the use of the stun gun in Bay City, Michigan. 
Okay, I'm appalled that a child died. That is absolutely inexcusable. That is an absolute lack of training. And here's how I did it when I was ombudsman. <clears throat> you noticed I'm not blaming the officers. I'm blaming the chief of police. I'm blaming the mayor of Bay City, the city council of Bay City, the state legislature of the state of Michigan, and to some degree the governor. We need to control the use of this lethal weapon in the state of Michigan. And we need to get actively involved in the debate should we even be using it. I've been speaking in the wrong end of the mic, but my name is Terry Bank and that's my two